is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sorry, just saying. I lost the word. Here, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord. John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after, after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you can hear the sound of it, for you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not perceive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpents in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of Christ. Christ to you and Christ. Please be seated. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord and Father, we give you thanks for yet another opportunity to come into your presence. May you speak to us even this day. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. I am aware we have been going through a sermon series and today we will be looking at confident in the gospel. Confident in the gospel. In order to do this, I will take us to a few places in scripture, but we'll try to keep it short and sweet as we normally do at this 9 a.m. service. I would love to start with the definition <clears throat> of confidence. So what is confidence? Uh, the Oxford Dictionary said, the feeling of belief that one can have faith in or rely on someone or something. That's the feeling of belief that we can rely or have faith in something or someone. Let me look at another definition. Confidence means feeling sure of yourself or your abilities, not in an arrogant way, but in a realistic, secure way. <clears throat> Confidence isn't about feeling superior to others. It is a quiet inner knowledge that you are capable. Confident people feel secure rather than insecure. Let's look at a bit of a religious one. <clears throat> a multifaceted word that encompasses within Christian thought a range of aspects. Faith in God, certainty, assurance of one's relationship with God, a sense of boldness that is dependent on the realization of one's acceptance by God and a conviction that one's destiny is secure. In God. So if we have established this sort of def working definition of being assured, being secure, being reliant, 
on the word of God. And there is where our confidence is. Having that security. And our security is the gospel. But then what is the gospel? We can only answer the question of the gospel by looking at the whole scripture. In Mark chapter 1 verse 1. He said this is the good news of Jesus Christ. So the gospel is simply good news. And it is hinged, not that it's just good news, but it's the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I told you tomorrow I bought a house, it's a good news. If I told you this, uh, that this afternoon I shall have, be having a nice Sunday roast, it's good news. But the difference between the good news of Sunday roast and the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ is that Sunday roast will give you a bit of relish and enjoy enjoyment and then you can have a good siesta and uh, you'll be refreshed by the time you wake up. But the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ gives us eternal lives, eternal life, gives us eternal hope, secures us, protects us, defines who we are. So that's the difference between a good news and the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, if we take the Bible, which part of it is good news? Of course, we talk about the four Gospels as the Gospels that are directly about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we say that, are we saying that Ephesians is not about the Lord Jesus Christ? Or Acts of the Apostles? Or Prophet Isaiah? Or Habakkuk? Or Obadiah, Or Nehemiah? Or Zechariah? Or Ezra? Or Ruth? Or Genesis? Are these stories not about the Lord Jesus Christ? Few commentators or even pastors and priests and ministers have sort of walked their way through scripture and they have different opinions. Some people say the Bible contains the word of God but it's not all of the word of God. So you can find the word of God here but not everything written here is the word of God. Some that say that everything here is the word of God. Some other people say that this is Jesus Christ in full. There are people that say this is the revelation of the Son of God. <clears throat> Meaning that Jesus is much more than what we have. That we cannot simply reduce God to a couple of pages. I don't know the one you feel more comfortable with. Whether this is Jesus Christ's whole full stop complete. Or this is the revealed word of God that God allowed us to see. Or perhaps that in, within this book we can see Christ. But there are other things in here that are not Christ. Or simply, this is the gospel. Or maybe just the four gospels are the gospel. Let me give you my thoughts on it. I believe that this is the word of God, the Bible. It is the revealed word of God because God is entwined in the story of humanity. From Genesis to Revelation, we see God in every step of the way. We cannot separate our story from that of God. We cannot separate our failure, our weakness, our trials, our temptation from God. Because he is involved. He wants to save us. He, he, he interrupted the reality of humanity when we fell out of faith with him. Yet he came into our midst and is trying to restore us to himself. Indeed, this is the revealed word of God. Jesus Christ is much more than what he, he has told us. Because if God reveals everything about him to us, then our brains might not come. But God gave us a glimpse of who he is. So I believe that this is the word of God. And that is why we need to study it and know it. It is not just the four Gospels. Because we see a lot of things in the Old Testament that talks about Christ. The whole sacrificial system was simply about the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't about let us kill animals so that priests like me will have food. So why do we need to have confidence, not just in this book, 
into the gospel. And how did you even arrive at this book? Because there are several books. There is the um, book of Enoch, there is the gospel of Judas, there is, I think, third and fourth Peter, and uh, other books. So how did we arrive in these 66 books? History tells us that very early in Christian life, they already sort of agreed or had an idea of books that are what they are. They saw some books as authoritative and they saw some as letters. There were other letters that were written in the centuries where the Gospels and the, and the Epistles were re written, but some of them did, did not have the credence other ones had. They saw others. If, if the Bishop of Derby will write a letter to St. Mary Bolton, it's going to be different if I wrote a letter to St. Mary Bolton. Because one may come from a friendly perspective of encouragement. Oh, it was nice when I was here. But the bishop's letter will come with a certain level of weight. Because the bishop has some ecclesial power within our midst. So, but early Christians already knew. And the Old Testament was already sorted. It's the New Testament that they had a bit of challenges to. Now, who is this word of God? Who is this gospel? John chapter 1, verse 1, going down says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And through him, all things were made. This word was light. And it gave life to the world. So our confidence is not just in the idea of we have a nice book, is that we have a God who is real, who is powerful and strong and able to save, who is the light and the life of the world. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And through him, all things were made. That is where our confidence is. And that is why we should have confidence in the gospel. That what we have is not just a nice book, it's not just a collection of books. How can prophets who had different timelines to them prophesy about the same man? Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 prophecies and stories and things about him. Everything that was written about Jesus in the Old Testament, according to Isaiah, according to Micah, was fulfilled. Even if Jesus wanted to play pranks, he couldn't have determined where he was going to be born, who was going to give birth to him, how he was going to die. There were things that were way outside of his control. Because this gospel is a human. This gospel is God. And this human and this God met in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we, have, we are confident in the gospel. It's not simply something nice that we find this gospel as a person. The good news of the Lord Jesus Christ is he about himself, is his story. So be, that is where our confidence is. And that is where we ought to be confident in what God is doing. Our people say that you were saved. You were saved. Because that gospel saved you, saved me, saved us. That's why we have this church building. Because if we weren't saved, we will not be here. You and I have been saved. Saved. And that is why we need to share this gospel with reckless abandon. We need to share it as how, tell everybody. Put a sticker on your car. Wear a cross. Tell people that you're a Christian. Tell people of the Lord, love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you and I have been saved. And alas, if we don't share this good news, the world around us will be condemned. And that's why the Bible says in John chapter 3, where we read in our gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave. If the love of the Lord is within our hearts, shouldn't we also give? Give this gospel we have received. Give this grace we have received. Give this uh, message we have received. Give this good news we have received to the world around us. If we are the same with the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, no limitation, is not limited to race, to culture, 
to ethnicity, to gender, to age, to economic standing, to social class, to academic uh, pursuits, to whatever it is, there's no limitation. Whoever believes, there are people in their 90s that found faith in God. There are people in their early childhood that found faith in God. And that message must be spread by you and I. If the love of the Father is within us, we will have the same passion for the world to share this gospel that we have. To share this gospel that we have. That gospel ended. Christ Jesus did not come in to condemn the world. But that through him the world will be saved. Our message is not to tell people you are a sinner and you are dead. You are damned. <laughs> Our message is come to him, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. I would love to conclude by reading Romans chapter 1 from verse 16 and 17. I think Paul puts clearly what we are saying here today. Our confidence in the scripture in the gospel, and the reason why we should share it. Romans chapter 1, from verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who has faith. To the Jews first, and also to the Greek. For it is in the righteousness of God, for it is in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. And as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Let me read that again. <clears throat> I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. To the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live 